I was playing soccer and I got kicked and I knew something happened to me. I knew that something was out of whack. I was 11 and I knew someone was right. So we went to the hospital, it wasn't broken or fractured. And so I laid on the couch with a purple leg for like three months and no one would diagnose me. They didn't know what was going on, why I was having seizures. And then um, finally I was diagnosed about three months later and they told me they'd have to cut off the leg. The doctors were preparing us for that, but luckily we didn't have to. Some people get it in their face, some people have it in their entire body, other people have it in just a limb. Mine traveled all over the place, and you can see it. it your arm turns purple, like I could see exactly my sensitive spots. You can touch here, <laughs> this isn't purple or red, um, you can't touch here. How I describe it to people is simply that whatever the pain receptors are, pain indicators are in the body, uh, don't quit firing. They start and they can't stop. The vibration in the, the kitchen with the, vi with the uh, refrigerator, that would drive her nuts. Like I can't be outside because if the wind blows, it's like pins and needles are going through me. Often we would just have to go to the hospital in the middle of the night just so they could give her Valium or something, some morphine and a Valium or something so she could calm down and control the pain herself. When she was first diagnosed, I just remember thinking, how awful, I wouldn't, want to, I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy. And just thinking, Abby's never gonna have a regular life, Abby's always gonna be in the hospital. The RSD itself, um, of course we'd never heard of it, didn't understand it, didn't know what it was. Um, initially, I think we weren't sure that it wasn't all in her mind. And that's because that's what we were told. You know, Abby really wasn't suffering like she said she was. I know my sister. This is not in her head. Something is physically going on. I lived on morphine. Like, they put a pump in my stomach, and it was stitched into all the nerves. I lived on that off and on for like nine years. <laughs> the RSD itself is pain that never seems to end. It's day and night. Abby lived often in a scale of pain from zero being the lowest to, to 10 being the highest. Abby lived in eight, nine, and 10 for years. The treatments that they did when I first was diagnosed would be considered barbaric <laughs> to what they do now. <laughs> I remember walking out of the house to go to Huntington and my mom and dad sitting next to Abby and Abby being on a stationary bike and Abby yelling, screaming, telling my parents to stop it and she can't do this anymore and how bad this hurts. And my mom and dad just telling Abby to keep going. Keep moving, Abby, keep moving. But that we were harsh, we really were. But, and we were blaming her for her situation. But that's, you know, we know that's wrong. But at the time, that's, that was the best information we had, that the only way she was gonna get better was to exercise her way out of this thing. And of course, exercise for her, uh, 
the analogy they used was like putting anything you did or anything you touched her would be like putting a hot skillet to your skin. And we were asking her to do that over and over again. And that was very unfair. I was in physical therapy the whole nine years. The treatments changed. <laughs> they would, at the very beginning, it was like scrub brushes and boiling hot water next to a bottle or next to a bucket of freezing cold ice water. You stick your foot in freezing cold ice water for three minutes, stick your foot in the boiling hot water for two. That would hurt anybody. <laughs> I mean, that would just kill anybody. So if someone like hypersensitive, it was like the worst thing in the world. Like I wanted them to cut it off. The worst thing was when we confronted the big confrontation, when she wasn't doing her exercises like we thought she should be doing. And so we all confronted her and we were, that was the meanest any of us ever were to Abby, I think in our lives. Uh, but the plan was, okay, we're going to tell her like it is. Abby, you've got to do what you've got to do. It turns out that those exercises probably weren't the greatest thing in the world. They might have kept, you know, some muscle tone or something, but they really weren't the cure. They take scrub brushes and just rub it all over my leg, and it would just send me through the roof, and my parents would do that to me, and because they had to, you know, they didn't, they, they were being told, okay, this will help your daughter. You got to do this. I feel like there were times where Abby was just pushing the family apart. God, that's awful for me to say, but there, yeah, I just but felt like there were just times that she just did not care. I think there were several times in Abby's episodes where she was just depressed and did not want to do anything and just did such negative things to herself. We had seen it come and go. In our minds, RSD was an episodic thing anyway. Other people had experienced it differently than we had. But initially, we saw it go away and then it came back and, then, and, then, and that's how we experienced it. So we looked at her life more as when we thought about it that it would be like this, that there would be episodes. Our fear was always that one day it wouldn't go away and that she would continue to get worse and worse and lose the use of her limb. So my freshman year, it was getting really bad and we went to Boston Children's Hospital, which is Boston, of course. Um, and I was there for, gosh, 80 some days. I had it worse in my leg. So I was on crutches, I couldn't walk on it. The bone in my leg where I hadn't used it um, became the, size, the width of an eggshell. So it was very deteriorated, my leg was very atrophied, um, and plus it had become cramped up like this, just bent and over to the side, because that was a comfort position. But after they got my leg straight, they had to work on keeping it straight because without the brace it was not straight. <laughs> One of the worst days I remember was in Boston and they they banned the parents from those therapy sessions and I know why because you you would any parent would have stopped it along the way I think um, but I happened to walk in early and I heard her crying and asking him to stop and uh, the pain she was going through was obviously enormous and um, yeah, I chose the chicken way. I left. I, but at the time, I thought she had to do that. One minute, Abby would be fine and healthy and running around. And the next minute, we'd be in this personal hell. Um, it, it's just up and down. It's like once you get your emotions settled again, we're going through all this emotion again. Um, it's like mom was better and then mom wasn't better. Abby was better and then Abby wasn't better. So it was just, it was a roller coaster ride. I ended up having a nervous breakdown and, um, uh, and I don't remember even the year that was brought on. And I, I just know that it was pushed by the circumstances of Abby's not being able to help my, my child and it finally just got too much for me. And, um, and I ended up in, in the hospital for a while myself. It's like she had to go, you know, she, 
just had to let all fences down and get sick herself. So my sister um, basically, you know, took care of me. And my dad would come up on the weekends, and sometimes after work he'd come up. And, but, you know, it was hard for him too. Hayden, our oldest daughter, was so supportive of her sister. And I look back on it now and I'm afraid I have I have guilt because I'm afraid she had to take the second place in the family oftentimes when she shouldn't have had to because of Abby's illness. I think I was able to say things to Abby that mom and dad right. could not say. In a way, I feel like I maybe had to grow up a little faster. I can remember the good times, but when the when, when the episodes would come back, I would just remember just all hell breaking loose, and I don't really remember. I know when Abby had RSD, I wasn't allowed to be a teenager. I had to take care of myself. I had to take care of Abby, and sometimes I had to take care of Mom. I do feel like I was robbed in a sense, but in another sense, Abby, I wasn't. I was able to go out with my friends and date and do regular teenage things. We would get frustrated with Abby because you just get so frustrated with a chronic pain person because they get so wrapped up in themselves because the pain is always there and so of course you're wrapped up in yourself and Hayden being a, a child herself, a teenager herself, she often had times where she was, would get so mad at Abby because she would be so self-absorbed. Dad and I decided we were going to do an intervention. Abby was not doing her exercises. Abby wasn't eating right. Abby was not taking care of herself. So Dad and I pretty much went in and... Abby, at that point, was through this, was just like, I don't care. I don't care. I don't care what you say. But the day after, there's definitely some new fire under her step. That's some really mean things well, were that I regret saying, but I was that vicious tiger and I was just trying to get her to do her stuff. I don't have like a lot of really vivid memories of some things and you should remember, you know, remember what you're doing when you're 12 and 13 and 14 years old and and I don't it, it gets really scrambled and confused and so and so that part's hard when I got sick again it happened so quick um, I was having that seizures that night like the night I got sick I knew when I got sick it hit me. I was in the hospital that night. <laughs> and I, I think we were just tired. And I mean, it was one of those really low moments where it's just like, okay, what do we do now? We just, there's nothing we can do. We were really searching for radical alternative medicine because the regular stuff was just not working for us. Abby was dating a boy and he felt he was brought into Abby's life to help her with RSD. And he did multitudes of um, internet searching for us. And he found Dr. Rhodes, who was a podiatrist, who is a podiatrist in training in Corpus Christi, Texas, who himself got RSD. And none of the treatments worked for him, the traditional treatments. And he started working and studying and came up with the fact that his, his basis is the body is electric. And the sympathetic nervous system with RSD goes totally out of whack. And you need to sort of shock it into behaving again and working correctly. We showed up in Texas and we go to this clinic and it's a tiny clinic on the side of a road in Corpus Christi, Texas. <laughs> and my mother and I look at each other like, what are we doing? 
I look at it and I'm like going, oh my God, we've wasted all this money. You know, this, I can't believe anything good will come out of this. And then Dr. Rose came out and he gave me a hug and I just felt his energy and his warmth and. They put her on magnets and also electrical currents to various parts on her body. The first three weeks were so bad. It hurt, it was very painful. I would, we'd do five hour treatments in the morning, go back to the hotel, or go back to um, the Ronald McDonald House. I would scream until I made myself pass out. For a lot of treatments, I was just present. You know, I didn't really care what they were doing as long as it numbed me out. One day after we'd been there quite some time, um, had told me, she said, I, I want you to come back. I want you to come into the office with me today. I want you, you know. And uh, she went to her, she went into the treatment room and I was sitting up front and they, the, Dr. Rhodes said, Susan, come on back here. I want to talk to you for a second. And he had me back in a hallway and Abby came out of her treatment room without crutches. And she was walking. And it was like, you know, the scene in the Shirley Temple movie. And she helps the little girl to get out of the wheelchair and walk. And she does that for, and the little girl gets out of her wheelchair and walks to her father for Christmas. That's what this was for me. It was, there wasn't a dry eye in that whole office building that day. To see her recover um, has made us all believe in miracles, I think, to a man, we all do. Um, you know, nothing, miracles, no problem. You know, I, I expect them every day now. A lot of Abby's play when she was a little girl were making up stories and plays and they acted them out. We started putting her into children's theater and she just loved it. I mean, it, it was like, you know, she'd really found a niche that she really loved. And it didn't matter how small the part was, it was the fact that she was acting and on stage and being a part of a theatrical company. But then the RSD hit and there was no possible way we could get her into to any acting. Acting's always been something I've known that I was gonna do. You know, when you think of, when you're little and you think about, okay, this is what I'm gonna do when I grow up, it's always been acting. For the first time, I felt like I had a little bit of hope and I just, school wasn't what I wanted to do. So my new boyfriend, who was my physical therapist, um, we started looking around for like small talent agencies and I found one in Cincinnati, Ohio. And he'd call me and for auditions and just like silly stuff, you know. Um, but it just, it lit the fire. <laughs> it lit the fires. I didn't know that for the longest time that that's what she wanted to do. Because we didn't talk about, we were living in now. We, we didn't think of the future because the now was so, it was so immediate and so powerful that I don't think Leo and I ever thought about the future much. But Abby was in the back of her mind, still thinking about acting. So after like that, I lived in Cincinnati for like four months and then dropped out of school and I think had $400 in my pocket, convinced my boyfriend to drive me to New York City. <laughs> and I did it, and, you know, it was, and it's really great. Like I'll be sitting on the subway and all of a sudden something will flash in my head and I'll just know that this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And that is just an amazing, powerful feeling. Now, and it's like moments like that, that I stay here and <laughs> do what you have to do to get by. The first year she was in New York, she'd already had enough hours, she got her SAG card. You know, she is, 
She's not waiting for her agent. She's not waiting for her her manager. She's not waiting on anybody to get her a job. She is out there. I'm a strong believer of people are all given talents. I can't pick up a guitar and play. Just because I don't have an ear for music, I can't get behind a camera and make a really, really good film, but I can be in front of a camera. I feel like that's one thing I do well. Do I know you? I'm your daughter. You're all grown up? I grew up without you. Why, Daddy? Why couldn't you change? Kobe, I don't understand. Wasn't I worth it? Couldn't you have tried? You stayed the same and Mother left you. She took me with her. She never let me see you. She was afraid of you. The first time she was rejected for a, for a part that we all thought she was going to get, I remember how I felt about it, and I thought, you know, I can't ever get that excited again about something she thinks she's going to get, uh, because the letdown is, is amazing. It's a lot about what you look like, and it's a lot about who you know, but at the very, very end, none of that matters. You know, I, I don't want people to watch my work and not leave the theater thinking about it. You know, I want them to be touched by it. But now I have a great respect for her threshold of pain or whatever you want to call that, whatever that is. Um, she's, she can handle almost anything. And that has to do, with, of course, with pain physically, but also just in her life, that this RSD prepared her, in some sense, for what she's chosen to do in her life, and that is this acting thing that she's doing. It's a whole lot of rejection. It's a whole lot of pain. When I get to a certain point, I'm like, okay, I'm happy here. And then as soon as I do it, I'm like, uh-uh, I've got to have more. I want to do more, I want to do better, I want to do harder stuff, I want to challenge myself more. The fact that she's pursuing this at all, the fact that she has a life outside of a hospital room or her bedroom is, is complete for me. She doesn't understand it that way. I tell her, oh, you, you, uh, you auditioned for that show today. Well, I didn't get it. I said, yeah, but you auditioned for that show today. The one thing I think for Abby, it's been th the passion. I don't know what was there before. It's hard to measure, but now I know. I know that she is passionate about what she does. She's going to continue to do whatever it is she's passionate about. Uh, and if she's consumed by whatever her passion is, I think maybe that's what people should do in their lives. Once the right person finds her, once she's in that right role, that, that spirit is going to be just illuminating a film someplace. It's made us all believe in the richness of life, that you really should appreciate every single moment of life, and also the fact that we we all, especially Abby, are determined to get on with our lives very positively and um, take that energy that could have been really negative energy and put it into a positive force of life. I had a doctor tell my dad that I should be winning an Academy Award. So, but that's gonna happen later. <laughs>